Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. What accountants tend to do, I think, when they're recruiting and when they're sort of moving or allocating tasks, is they tend to do it based on seniority. So if someone leaves, the next senior person will tend to get that role. And, and which is, you know, it's a fairly crude way of doing it, actually, when you think about it. What I'd like to do is allocate stuff to do to people based on their skill set. So I like to understand who's good at what and what, the, what they're passionate about. And I find that if you work on that basis, then you tend to get a much better quality of work because people are really interested in, in what they're doing or it suits their technical skills. So they're getting quite a bit of satisfaction from doing it. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Strength in the Number show. Today I'm talking with Erica Ingham and Erica's unusual in that she's not only got those traditional CFO responsibilities but she's also in charge of the human resources or the HR department amongst others and combined with her passion for people not only in finance but the rest of the business too makes Erica one of the most listened to speakers when you attend uh, finance events and conferences. And what I'm most interested in talking with Erica about is some of the amazing things she's been doing on the people side of finance and the business during her time at Mediacom. And also in this podcast, we go into the people skills that finance and accounting professionals must learn as they progress in their careers, uh, some approaches to improve diversity in teams. We also go into what neurodiversity means and its value to organizations and the importance of allocating work to people based on their skill sets and what they're most passionate about, uh, which you just heard in the intro too. So look, I hope you really enjoy this episode with Erica. I definitely enjoyed catching up with her. Uh, last time we met was, then we shared a taxi together, so it was great to get her on the show. Now, Erica's super busy, so we really appreciate her making time to come on and share her insights uh, with, with you on the show. Uh, last time we were uh, chatting was in the back of a taxi, uh, sharing a taxi to Amsterdam Airport. And Erica does touch on a number of key resources uh, throughout the show. So we've done our best to trap those in the show notes where you can find the timestamps and the various ways to connect with Erica and identify those resources at sitnshow.com. And as always, really appreciate your support for the show and recommending us to your colleagues and friends. We're on all the major platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud and YouTube. So that's enough for me. So without further ado, over to Erica and the show. So, Erica, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Hey, look, I'm delighted to finally track you down. You're a very busy lady, <laughs> and uh, I'm so excited to uh, to share the next few minutes with uh, with our audience and yourself. But um, but again, our audience may not be as familiar with you. So, would you mind maybe taking us through a brief uh, career <laughs> journey for yourself in finance and accounting? Yeah, um, well, actually, I'm a language graduate from university, so no experience in accounting at all whatsoever. I went to the careers advisor in the week that I was doing my finals, and she said, what would you like to do? Would you like to teach? And I said, well, I don't really fancy that very much. And she said, well, what do you really want to do? I said, I want to travel the world. And she said, have you thought about SEMA? Because accountancy qualifications are recognized all over the world and I said oh that sounds all right she said are you any good at math and I said I'm not bad at math and that's really how I got into accountancy and ironically I'm on the SEMA regional board and uh, when I joined a few months back everyone went around and introduced themselves and how they got into SEMA and I told them that story of my very uh, random journey into the accountancy profession so that's kind of where it all started, really. So I applied and, and worked for m and on their graduate trainee scheme, which was quite interesting. I got to look after the uh, franchises. I then went and, and also internal audit, which was a nice grounding. Um, I then went to work for MTV, which was absolutely fantastic fun, mm. looking after all the European facilities for their studios and transmission and edit suites over in Camden. From then, I went to work for Fox Films, looking after going to age myself now but looking after home video and dvd <laughs> um which is really shouldn't say that i don't think 
and then following on from that, got quite an exciting opportunity to go to Amsterdam and set up the first video on the band well, VOD and NVOD service in Europe. So went over there really on what was supposed to be a six to nine month project and stayed there for many, many, many years. Kind of a place that I still really consider home following that due to childcare mainly uh, because I was traveling all over the place. With that, as we rolled it out of Europe, I moved back to the UK where I went to work for BBC Radio or Audio Music, sort of looking after the radio stations and also various events like um, events in the park and stuff. I had a very young child and I was commuting down to London every week, which was sort of quite hard going really. So I decided I'd better get a job up north where I live and, and where my kids were based where I had good childcare. Um, so I, I sort of uh, took a job doing some turnaround work. It was uh, sort of recession time. I worked with a variety of businesses in the northwest doing some turnaround work and then set up my own business providing mainly uh, acquisitions, sales, um, fundraising, mainly working with VC-backed businesses. Mm-hmm. Did that for a while and then sold it to an accountancy firm, which I enjoyed less, to be honest, because I didn't have as much sort of business contact as I liked. And so came out of that following. I gave a talk to some people where I highlighted the importance of waking up in the morning and really wanting to go to work. And as I said, it, I kind of realised that I stopped waking up and wanting to go to work. <laughs> um, so decided that accountancy practice was not really for me and then ended up joining Mediacom North. So Mediacom North is a very large um, advertising agency with offices sort of all over the north of England. And I, uh, we have a creative agency and a digital agency as well. And so I look after the finances, um, HR and associated other stuff uh, here been here for about over five years now which is uh, quite a long time for me because I get bored pretty quickly but uh, media commas managed to keep me very interested yeah so look that's a, that's a fantastic journey I would you describe it mostly as a sort of a media industry driven journey or or is that just happened but was that more like by purpose or more by, by accident Media industry is really interesting and, and where I am now brings together sort of a bit of everything really, ah. so the radio, the TV, uh, the film, so that's quite interesting because obviously we're, we're, we're advertising on all those different types of media as well as, mm. as well as VOD of course as well, so it kind of feels like it's all come together a little bit. When I had my own business, I worked for a variety of companies, but I'd say that my sort of area of expertise really is kind of digital media tech, anything creative. When I moved back to the north of England, I worked for a car manufacturer briefly. So (laughs) it's very, very transferable skills. But I think that at that point, there wasn't a great deal of media companies up in the north of England and at that time actually I joined Creative England which is an organisation focusing on promoting creative uh, media and tech industries outside of outside of London and it was a reason the reason I joined the board was I felt very passionate that we were training people up here in some brilliant universities and then they were all tending to go down to London to seek employment in the industry. Mm-hmm. Now that's changed radically because at that time Media City didn't exist, uh, the opportunities didn't exist and, and it's a totally different cup of tea now actually which is fantastic but uh, so there was but there was a period where I was working out of the industry uh, for a variety of companies really but I do think that it's, it's the same skill set right it's the same business mm. acumen so yeah, short of you probably not find me in manufacturing because that's not really my forte I've never really worked in a manufacturing business but mm. anything that kind of involves people or tech then I'm pretty interested in it that's a it's a good way to look at it i i, I don't want to say like um how do you say manufacturing dying uh, or media and tech are more important it's probably more knowing and finding your strengths throughout your career and i that's mm-hmm. what i was getting a sense of when you were going in the career journey i mean it's a it's a fantastic story to tell how you fell into becoming an accountant i mean it's, yeah it's yeah. you know i was just think it's a thing about my own one actually like i wanted to be a fighter pilot in the u.s navy um top gun <laughs> i think uh, convinced me there but, yeah. but no it's it's great this no but it's great getting that that story in that sense but i suppose you know as you've gone through that journey i mean is there any particular moments that stand out in your mind as being particularly memorable I think going over and working in Amsterdam was really memorable for me because we were doing something that was really quite new that I'd never done before. 
there was a, only a few of us starting the business over there, which grew mm. massively and, and rolled out all over Europe and all over the place. And what was really nice was we needed teams with specific expertise. So we were recruiting people literally from all over the world. I think at one point I had 15 different nationalities in my team, which was great fun. And people were coming over there and obviously didn't have any kind of support infrastructure or friends or family. And we were just moving mm. them over. And so there was a great sense of teamwork. I remember, you know, someone would move over and we'd all go and help paint their house <laughs> over weekends <laughs> and just really help people settle in. And so I think what we what I learned there was the kind of importance of a great culture yeah, also yeah. in um, in amsterdam i find that the dutch tend to do work for people that they respect and there isn't a great deal of you know i will do that because they are my boss doesn't get you very far so that was quite an interesting learning you know when i first got there because you know people didn't do stuff unless they were on side and then that's uh, that's quite a useful skill to have i think so i i think it was new place new teams, you know, very people orientated and also, you know, new tech. It was just overall everything about it was exciting, really. I don't want to skip the people side, but just on the technology side, it was that was the video on demand, right? The way they yeah. to set it up. Yeah. It's like, was there any sense of how big that was ever going to get? I mean, looking what like what happened to all the channels now and everything moving sort of online and, and Netflix and so on? I think we thought that it would, but when you told people, they didn't really believe you. I, I remember very <laughs> clearly, like saying to people, we're, we're, we're designing this EPG and it's an electronic program guide. And, you, you know, it's like a remote control and you use it and you can scroll and you can pick what movie you want to watch and then you click on it and you can watch it people were like no <laughs> um, so um I, and that, that's the bit that really sticks in my mind so that that was quite funny yeah you know it, it's amazing when you look back how things change but you know there's still some core skills i think that as finance people that, that we need to have you know, the reason why I wanted to get back to the people side of it is, um, you know, like I think the last time we were speaking, we were coming back from Amsterdam and actually I could tell the affinity you could, you actually had for the place. It was just, um, mm. you know, you had obviously had a place close in your heart. But um, but also that people side of it, that's something that never changes the importance of people. No matter what happens with tech or digital or, or wherever that's going, uh, people people are quite key. So, I mean, I really appreciate you, you sharing that with our audience. But one thing you've been sharing a lot of when you've been speaking and so on is actually that people angle and it's probably no accident then that you've got responsibility for human resources in your current role how do you describe or square the, the people angle with your core responsibilities or traditional responsibilities as an accountant well i mean my uh, director of hr is fantastic so she's a sort of technically qualified hr person and and we work together on the kind of vision of what we're going to do so i actually asked to look after hr because i was really keen to do some initiatives around diversity and inclusion which is something that i'm really passionate about and so going back to the finance team aspect of it i think historically we've trained our people you know it was always excel skills courses on macros in excel and then it was sort of powerpoint skills and then presenting yeah. skills and what we we've always tended to miss was uh, training people in digital skills and a SEMA has actually addressed that they brought out some great um, digital training online which is quite handy but people skills are so important and mm. when I recruit people these days the fact that they're a qualified accountant there's a certain level of technical technical expertise that's almost a given and mm -hmm. what I'm looking for is kind of drive and how they think and how they'll fit in with the rest of the team. And, and all those softer skills are so, so important, which there's some that you can't learn, but obviously there's, there's a great deal that you can as well. That's the encouraging bit about the people side. Of the, and you've actually shared a number of these, these things that we can and should be doing in finance. So, so now that you've got like the broader portfolio, is there, is there some sort of things uh, from a finance perspective we can learn uh, that we should be doing maybe uh, from a more people oriented approach or things we could be doing better there? I mean, I think we can always do stuff from people oriented approach. What accountants tend to do, I think, when they're recruiting and when they're sort of moving or allocating tasks, is they tend to do it based on seniority. So if someone leaves, the next senior person will tend to get that role. Yes. And, yeah. and 
<laughs> which is, you know, it's a fairly crude way of doing it, actually, when you think about it. What I'd like to do is allocate stuff to do to people based on their skill set. So I like to understand who's good at what and what, the, what they're passionate about. And I find that if you work on that basis, then you tend to get a much better quality of work because people are really interested in, in what they're doing or it suits the technical skill. So they're getting quite a bit of satisfaction from doing it. And, you know, people like all kinds of stuff. I think we tend to think in finance that everybody wants to be a business partner. But actually, you know, there's some brilliant people that just really love technical, technical accounting work as well. They find that really satisfying. So it's kind of horses for courses, really, isn't it? But um, as a wider organisation, I do think that, you know, a focus on inclusivity is really, really important and ensuring that our teams are really diverse. So we get that diverse type of thinking and diverse creativity and people tend not to use the word creativity very much in finance yeah. functions because yeah. it sets alarm yeah. bells off <laughs> but everybody <laughs> likes to say accountants but you know I think in terms of what we're doing with data how we're looking at data how we're looking at commercials how we're looking at presenting our financial information there is creativity is needed in coming up with with workable and kind of you know better and more efficient solutions for stuff as well so i do think it's pretty important i suppose do you have any sort of approaches to improving say the diversity and inclusion within the, the teams you're responsible for yeah, I mean, we've got really low turnover, which is really great, I think, because it sort of shows that we're, what we're doing is, is on track. We've done um, dyslexia training and autism training. We've done mental health training. We've got mental health allies that people can speak to who are trained in assisting people and pointing them in the right, right direction should they need further help. So we've done a lot of stuff around neurodiversity and mental health recently. We've changed our recruitment practices to facilitate applications from neurodiverse individuals who maybe don't want to spend, you know, hours filling in a form or maybe, you know, would benefit from seeing interview questions in advance, that type of stuff. Because we don't just want people to pass interviews, right? We want them to do a great job when, when they're in the team. And I think the, the stuff on mental health is really important. Finance teams traditionally have quite tight and quite aggressive deadlines that are totally immovable in terms of reporting. And, you know, that can be quite stressful. I remember when I was working on the reporting side, being there till sort of two, three in the morning. I mean, thank God we don't do that now where we work. But I hear I hear a story of a lot of people still doing that. That takes its toll on people. And I think it's very important that we, we look after our staff from a well-being point of view as well. Flexible working is massively helpful. And pretty much most of my team work flexibly. And that's not just people with children it's people with you know other caring responsibilities elderly parents people who just really is really important to them that do a really long workout in the morning and then can start slightly later and finish later as well just loads of things like that I think which are which are really important to help people blend work with sort of outside work yeah, I couldn't agree more. My only thing is now is like, um, I'm just a bit worried for you because you probably have a queue of, of people listening to the podcast wanting to come and work in your team. So, um, <laughs> so but, but uh, I mean, I mean, uh, no, seriously, it's, it's like a fantastic working environment where you're going to get the, the most out of people, but also they'll get the most out of the environment too. Is, um, I mean, are there any sort of main challenges with embarking on something that, that some traditionalists might call very ambitious uh, to try and achieve? I don't know really. I think when we started, nobody had really heard of the word neurodiversity mm -hmm. in one aspect. It was kind of like, we need to, I want to roll out a neurodiversity program. Well, what does that kind of look like? Do we actually know much about it? But there was the back of that. We went to speak to the experts like Autism UK and the British Dyslexia Association. And so that was massively, massively helpful working mm -hmm. with those organisations. From a mental health point of view, we, we worked with Anxiety UK in mind as well. So we were able to go and if we didn't, if it was something we didn't know, we, we knew a person who did. And I think that was really helpful. And they have a lot of recommendations as well on best practice in the workplace. So if anyone is thinking of doing anything similar, I think their websites are a really useful source of information as well. That, that's fantastic. And I, I'll, I'll make sure we dig out the appropriate links in the show notes as well. 
Erica, because mm-hmm. again, I, again, these are the sort of things that I very much support. And, and actually mentioned on neurodiversity, I, I think it was only 18 months ago I actually heard the expression. I was very curious to know what it was, yeah. but it sounds sounds fantastic. <laughs> I mean, what what would what would neurodiversity mean mean to you if, if you were to try and explain it to someone, maybe our audience? I think well, neuro- neurodiversity tends to cover things like dyslexia, autism, dyspraxia, ADHD. So people who think in slightly different ways or maybe work in slightly different ways. And it's about, you know, if you take dyslexia, for example, there's a huge amount of dyslexics in creative industries, uh, also in the police, uh, weirdly, as well, sort of in the investigative side. Um, (laughs) And dyslexics are very good at sort of, and this is what BDO told me, dyslexics are very good at kind of big picture thinking, you know, uh, sort of cutting through the noise to get to the solution, also very creative. And so we want people who are good at different things with different skill sets in our organisation and in our team. Teams. And it's kind of how do we go about making the recruitment process and making our working practices more friendly? So we've got dyslexia screenings as well at work. If anyone thinks that they might be dyslexic, they can oh. they can do the screening, and then it recommends loads of really useful stuff to them in terms of ways of working. You know, sometimes it work. It, some people it's recommended sort of talk and type software and, and various bits like that, which can be really handy. It can make a massive difference to people. And the training shows the sort of best way of passing on information for someone who's taking over a project if you're a line manager and how people whose brains work in different ways how, how they tend to think and what's the best way of presenting information and stuff so I think that's been really quite useful off the back of that a lot of people have said oh actually I find that really handy because I'm dyslexic or I have autism and yeah that's absolutely right and the training that we put in place for all our managers was so well received it was it was fantastic actually so that was great yeah, it's it's very positive to see that uh, that uh, coming about, and I'm um, again I'm I just said like uh, I'm curious to see and hear what our audience think about um, this sort of movement and having these uh, I suppose supports available and and having the likes of yourselves or Erica sort of show us the way on these things. So so thank you very much for that. Is um I mean like you know you've been giving us great advice. I was curious though. I mean what's been the best bit of advice you've ever received? Probably pick your battle. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was when I was younger, I was inclined to fight everything. And someone said to me, "Yeah, it's really great that you you're arguing with them over that." And I'm sure you're right on all of them, but maybe pick your battles. That was an old boss of mine, and I think that was probably good advice. I've passed that on to a few people over the years. I think. My, my favourite <laughs> saying is, is was one of Einstein's, which I'm probably paraphrasing horrifically, but it, it kind of only a stupid person does the same thing twice, looking for a different outcome. I think that's also quite useful advice as well. <laughs> Something that I quote quite a lot. Yeah, I definitely could do with a dose of that uh, now and again, particularly in this technological age. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but no, th- thanks for sharing that, Eric. And um, I suppose from a, a resource perspective, would you would you sort of have any books or videos that that you might recommend our audience go check out that you found particularly useful? There's so many, isn't there? Like I'm I, I'm always buying brilliant books that people recommend, and then I'm pretty busy, so I'm a single mum of two young kids, and and work pretty hard, so they just kind of stack up on my bedside table a bit like planes <laughs> waiting to land at an airport, and I'm not sure I make that much progress with them. But there's there's, there's the usual ones, isn't there? Like start with why and various other books, but. For me, um, what I've been reading a lot recently is NLP books, and I know that we've we've discussed this before. A neuro linguistic programming is something that I find really really helpful. And there's there's a few books out there, you know. I mean, there's so many, but small techniques that can be really helpful. And I think um, NLP in business is is really interesting. Yeah, actually, just just on that one, someone said to me the other day, and I can't believe I didn't spot it before. But you know, like sometimes when you have to to read a book again, you sort of see stuff you hadn't seen before. Was this? Um, it was. I think it was called Coaching for Performance by Sir John Whitmore, and that's he's oh, the yeah. guy who came up with this goal framework, G O A L. And then someone said, "Did you know he was trained in NLP?" And I said, "Oh, that makes sense now, because <laughs> the oh, way he stacked God. out, he went through the the progressions in terms of observing, you know, what you wanted to achieve and the the current reality, the options, and then developing the willpower to do something about it. it was very much following an NLP type framework. And it's just like, ah, oh, now I get it. And then someone said, "Oh, Tony Robbins was into that as well." And it's like, oh yeah, now that you yeah. mention it, yeah, I can see that. So it's you know, for people get in terms of getting messages across and creating useful frameworks and things for others to follow, it does seem to be a very useful um toolkit maybe to have is that is that the right way to look at it i i think so 
so. And with NLP, you know, the, the linguistic side is very interesting and your choice of words and moving towards positive rather than negative goals. And there's so much stuff in there that's really useful and very applicable to business, I think, that sort of any good introduction to NLP is always worth a read. Yeah, well, let's appreciate the recommendation there, Derek. And uh, I'll uh, I'll uh, see if we can put some some useful links up on the show notes around NLP as well. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I I guess then if uh, some of our audience wish to continue the conversation, uh, where's the best place to connect with you at? Me generally, probably through LinkedIn actually. Yeah, yeah, That's probably the yeah. best. Oh, yeah. Just send me a message and I'll come back to you. Yep, awesome, awesome. Or, or I have to say, you now to our uh, audience, I found Erica very friendly, so it's very approachable. You can go up walk to her after. Her. She does a speaking event as well. <laughs> always, <laughs> oh, oh, you know, seriously, I've always enjoyed our conversations, Erica. So thank you very much, um, for that. And I, I suppose yeah, look, it's always uh, nice to bump into you. Ah well, uh, likewise. <laughs> likewise. Um, yeah, I won't be that awkward guy asking the awkward questions, uh, which I, I tend to tend to do. So um, I, I promise you that for next time. But I suppose in terms of in terms in terms of you know we covered a lot. I you know I really thought you had a, a sort of a fantastic story in terms of how you came into accounting and, and and your journey through the media experience, the accounting practice, the turnarounds you were doing. But what really shone through for me was that the people side. And um, I, you know, I'd love, I, I really loved how you've gone into that and helping us understand that better. But also the, some of the key skills we should be picking up. I mean, would you have any maybe parting thoughts for audience before we uh, wrap up the podcast together? I suppose if we want a high, high performing finance team, it's not all about, of course, uh, automation, AI, all the topics that everyone's discussing at the conferences are so so important. But at the end of the day, they are a team of people. And I think that we need to look at how best to get the best out of our people. In order to do that, you know, they need to be able to fire on all cylinders at work, feel comfortable where they are, and we we need to look after their well-being as well. And there's undoubtedly a business benefit to having all your people sort of on their A-game rather than not. And I think that's something that there's a finance team we need to explore, particularly particularly if we're looking after, you know, people businesses or service businesses. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think what a great way to to begin wrapping up the podcast. Erica, really appreciate investing your time with us today and coming on the show. Thank you very much. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me, I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. And when all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care. And let's keep building our strength in the numbers.